happiness. Everyone is looking for it, but we look for it in all the wrong places. What if we had a guide that showed us what John Wesley called the complete art of happiness? We do. Join us this fall as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, one sermon that changed the world. I remember <clears throat> my wedding day like it was yesterday. I remember it because <clears throat> it was an outdoor wedding. Does anybody know the number one rule for a good outdoor wedding? For it not to. So as we got closer and closer to that great day, and I mean it was beautiful out there, all the warning signs began to show itself. Oh, the storm clouds came rolling in. The news reports were talking about it was going to be something severe. And we just stood there, Katie and I. And this was a couple days before the wedding, and we were looking at all those beautiful white chairs. And we looked at that small white tent and wondered if we could get everybody under the white tent rather than out by the arbor and the white chairs, which we were originally planned. How are we going to make this work? What was going to happen there on my future father-in-law's front yard? We prayed and prayed and prayed, as you do, when you're saying, I really don't want it to rain. And oh, it rained. It rained hard. It rained long. Two days before the wedding. The day of the wedding, it was beautiful. The weather was nice, too. I absolutely love that day. We stood underneath something like this. Maybe you did too. You remember at your wedding day, the preacher gets to get up and say something really powerful. Now, there are a lot of powerful moments in life. There's a powerful moment, you know, when the, the fireman's standing there and there's somebody stuck on the third floor window and they're going to drop them into safety. And a second before they fall into those arms, they're free-falling. And then in that moment when they catch, get caught, oh, that's a beautiful, powerful moment. Let me tell you a powerful moment for a preacher. One of two I'll share with you this morning. When the preacher stands there and he looks at the couple about to get married and he says, I now pronounce you. Do you realize that those words, those declaration, that declaration brings something into existence that wasn't there before? Five seconds before those words, you're not married. Five seconds after those words, you're married. Oh, the power in the preacher's hand at that moment. The phrase, I pronounce you, carries with it a couple of things. It, it reminds you of your importance. Think about the fact that in this moment... Heaven and earth will forever change for you as the two become one. It issues you a challenge. You can't think for yourself anymore. You're not a party of one anymore. And it gives you comfort when you're struggling and you wonder, am I alone in this world? You know you're not. It's very similar to what Jesus does in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. We have this passage. We know it real well. We were taught it when we were kids. And let me just tell you, if you memorize it in one version, it is not easy to transfer later in life. But we remember this, this line when we were little about being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. The first thing Jesus does is he underlines your importance. You know that salt was so important that it was used as money. If you're out on the high seas at that time, you could use it as currency. 
It was used for fertilizing. It was used for preservation. It was used in sacrifice rituals. It was used as a metaphor for wisdom. Why? Because salt was so indispensable. And light. Have you ever been anywhere where the power went out and the lights went off and you realized in that moment just how important light is? Plenty. An early, early writer said, there is nothing more useful than salt and sunshine. You know it. And so Jesus is saying, I'm naming the most indispensable things in our culture. They are indispensable and so are you. Your importance. Don't ever forget this, he says. In this world, to this world, for this world, you are salt and light. And that means that calling someone salt and light is less about what you do and more about who you are. Realizing who you are can make a big difference in this world. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And I want you to listen to that language again. He doesn't say, I hope you will be salt. I hope you will be light. Oh, no. He says, you are salt. You are light. Listen to this carefully. You don't become salt. You are salt. You don't become light. You are light. Wasn't that long ago that I said to one of my friends, you know what? I just want to know that I've left an impression on grace. I just want to make a difference. I want to leave an impression on my daughter. And my friend said, well, whether you want to or not, try or not, guess what? You are. You thought about that? Everybody around you is being influenced by you, whether you know it or not. Whether you try or not, you simply are. The church is a visible community. It was always meant to be. Think about these metaphors Jesus uses, salt of the earth, light of the world, city on a hill. You know, back then in those days, he could have been referring to a number of things. Most people would probably think of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was known as the city on a hill, and it was called by many people light of the world. There's passages in the Old Testament that most Jews read as referring to Israel that says, you are the light to the nations. Josephus describes what it looked like after Herod rebuilt the temple with this very polished marble, and when the light hit it just right, it was like sheets of light that spread across the hills when you were looking at it at just the right time and just the right angle. But it wasn't just Jerusalem that comes to mind. If you weren't Jewish, you might think of Rome. Rome was called the city that sat on seven hills. And an early Roman historian called Rome the light of the world. But of course, Jesus is standing in Galilee at this time, and maybe he's referring to some Galilean city. Hippos wasn't that far. It sat on top of a rounded hill. And when it was lit up at night, it could be clearly seen from Capernaum. I want you to imagine right now what city comes to your mind. What have you seen growing up or in a picture somewhere? Maybe you're thinking of a Thomas Kincaid painting. But Jesus says, I want disciples to realize you should be as obvious as a city on a hill because guess what? You are. You are. And that issues us a challenge. If it turns out that we are salt of the earth and we are light of the world then what do we do with that? Verse 16 says, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father 
who is in heaven. You were called for this very purpose. You know, salt is a stable compound, sodium chloride. Salt doesn't lose its saltiness. Gold doesn't rust. But James says to some people who had forgotten who they were, your gold has rusted. And I've always wondered what James means by that because gold doesn't rust. Well, I know one kind of gold that does, fool's gold. Gold that looks like gold but isn't really gold. One of the signs you're not really gold is that you're rusting. Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. But what happens if the salt loses its saltiness? He could be referring to so, something they would have known at that time, like those salt deposits around the Dead Sea that were mostly a bunch of impurities and things like gypsum that looks like salt but isn't salt. And then when the rubber real salt was in there, it kind of ebbs away. What you're left with is just a bunch of unsalty salt, so to speak. Good for nothing. But I wonder, that's one possibility, but I wonder if he's sticking with what most people would have understood, which is that there's no such thing as unsalty salt. In other words, if we are the called out community and we're called to make a difference in this world, what good is it if we're called salt and we're not salty? What difference does it make in the world if you're sent into the world to be salt and light, but you're darkness and flavorless? What is the point of being the called out community sent to save the world if we're no longer effective? I think one of the options is it's a clear sign that we're not who we say we are. Oh, I want to be effective. But when I want to be effective, I usually think a couple of things that I really believe are misunderstandings if I'm reading this verse correctly. Here's one. I really sometimes assume that to be effective in this world is primarily about my words. It's interesting that words don't come up in this section. In fact... This whole section is based upon and built on Isaiah 42. And in Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4, the text says, My servant, the one I've chosen, he's going to not cry out in the streets. That sounds like meek. He's going to seek for justice. That's that language of justice and righteousness. A smoldering wick he won't put out, a bruised reed he won't break. That sounds like pure in heart and peacemaking. The first four verses describe my servant. And we all know that the servant is Jesus. Matthew tells us that. But it's also true that we are the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. So he's describing who Christ is, but he's also describing who the disciples ought to be. That's verses 1 through 4 of Isaiah 42, which fits with the first 12 verses of the Beatitudes. And then the next section of Isaiah 42 says that I am the Lord and I will take you by the hand and I will give you a covenant for the people and I will make you a light to the nations. I have a job for you. It's interesting that the servant won't cry out and be heard in the streets. Isaiah 42 says there won't be a thing he says that people will hear. Does that mean Jesus never said anything worth hearing? Well, he said the Sermon on the Mount. He clearly did. But remember the prophecy that's quoted as he's heading to the cross like a lamb before his shears. He opens not his mouth. He's going to let his deeds do his speaking for him. Sometimes we think our job in the world to be lights is lobbing those truth grenades over the wall that we've erected. Let me announce what's wrong with the world and then I know I'm being light. Let me stand real close but separate from the world and then I know I'm being salt. Try putting a salt shaker next to your meat and wait a week. 
close, but no preserve. Words. Second, I assume that I assume that they're going to see us do it. I know to be light and salt in the world is to do something that people will notice us doing it. The text does not say that they will see us. It says they'll see our works. What does that mean? The third thing I want you to notice is that I really think it's about my words, I think it's about them seeing me do it, and I assume that that means that they'll give me credit for it, and then my job is to say, well, thank you, but it really isn't me, it's God doing it through me. The text doesn't say that it's about our words, it doesn't say they'll see us at all, and it doesn't actually teach that they will appreciate the effects any time in my life. I want to show you a parallel passage. One, you, you may have not connected with this before. It's in 1 Peter chapter 2. Would you listen to Peter? Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. There's the language of being distinct. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you, as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. I'm convinced of two things if this passage is true. Number one, the gospel will never in mass be something that our culture wants to brazenly and openly accept. This idea if we just do it right, say it right, work it right, we will see the mass conversion of the entire world in our lifetime. Don't count on that. The gospel is offensive. And that when we do what we're called to do and be who we're called to be, expect the world to see us as wrong-headed and curse us as evildoers. But number two, there is something different about how we live that stays with them. Even if you and I don't, the works will. And the honor and glory will be given to God on the day when what we did is revealed as right. That means that this passage in Matthew 5 and verse 16 is the fitting conclusion to verse 12, remember, the Beatitudes are all in the third person. Blessed are they, blessed are they, blessed are they, until you get to the last one. Blessed are you. It moves to the second person, and what's the second person? It's about being persecuted. Blessed are you when they persecute you, and they say all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. There's that language of Peter. Rejoice and be glad, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Do you understand what he's saying? Letting your light shine is the role of a persecuted people. And that means it is only when we act as the servant is called to act. It's only when we recognize that we are what God calls us to be, that our works can bring glory to the Father and never to us. It's when we go running after justice and mercy that someone says, who lives and reasons like that? It's when we're not attached to the things of this world that someone says, who thinks like that? It's when we face persecution and respond with love and kindness that someone says, who dies like that? It is in living this surrendered life. It's in being the kind of person no one on earth knows, acknowledges, or accepts that the work that's left behind will stick with them and will become so obviously true on the day when the Lord visits us. Heard a story a few years ago 
back when McDonald's was doing the whole, you know, get park place and boardwalk and you get a million bucks. I remember because there was a children's home, a little Catholic orphanage. The lady walks out to her front door and she finds a little envelope. And in the unmarked envelope is boardwalk and park place. Somebody gave up a million dollars and nobody knows who they are. Who does that? It's someone who's unattached to the things of this world. It's someone who doesn't care about what happens to them, nor who gets the credit. But that story will follow. There's a woman when Jesus is sitting at a table and all the people are trying to talk about importance. There's a woman who pours the alabaster box of ointment and wipes with her hair and the people can't believe what's going on and who would waste such perfume and do such a thing and Jesus says even though we don't know who that was whenever the gospel is preached the story will be too I'm telling you how we live in this world will stick with people but not because we do it so well that people can't help but be amazed by it, give us glory for it, and go tell their friends to be more like it. It's when we live so different, so subtle, so unlike what anyone in the world would ever want or think, but they can't shake the story. And the story can only give glory to God because he's the only one they can point to. And the text says before others or before men, which is usually the language of Gentiles, usually the language of pagans, usually the language of the world. Those who don't even know God's name will say, this must be from somewhere else. That's who we are. If we're going to make a difference, we've got to remember that salt must always remain distinct from the meat. It doesn't make any difference if the salt is just like the meat. The salt has to be chemically different than the meat to make any good. We must be distinct from the world, but we must be fully present and willing to bind ourselves to it. Different, but fully present and willing to bind ourselves to it. To put it another way, it should look like the cross. Chemically distinct, but bound to it. The last thing that Jesus does is he offers us comfort. Marriage is hard. Marriage is really, really hard. Most people don't get to enjoy a marriage like Katie and I experience where one of us is always right. (laughs) One of us is very lucky. And I want to tell you, marriage is extremely difficult. It's so nice to know that there's comfort in it that says every single day with love and humbleness and forgiveness, every day is a new day. And I have someone in my life who knows me better than I know me and still loves me. What an amazing comfort marriage is. Would you listen to this? This is the first time in the whole gospel of Matthew that somebody has said that God is your father. Oh, there's language about the kingdom of God. There's language about being called sons of God. But that was always generic language Israel would use. But the only other time you have anything like that is in the baptism of Jesus in Matthew 3 where the heavens open and the voice from heaven looking at Jesus says, you are my son. If this is my son, then you are my father. That's language about Jesus. But now Jesus says what's true about me is going to be true about you. I want you to understand the power of this moment. Before you can be who you are, 
You've got to believe that you are. Do you remember that story? Do you remember the, the scene in the Disney movie, The Lion King? Where Mufasa is in the vision, shows up to Simba. And remember the line? Remember who you are. Are. You get your power. You get your motivation because of who God is. You are salt and light because He is the light of the world. You are saved, redeemed, chosen, and led because He walked the way of the cross and now is holding you by the hand. Isaiah 42. Before it says, I've called you to be a light to the nations, he says, I am the Lord your God, and I made you, and I called you, and I will take you by the hand. I'm telling you, you are because he is. And if there's any other thing you should remember about this, remember this. He called you to be disciples before he gave you the challenge. He called you disciples before he gave you the challenge. Do you remember this? The Exodus is where God pulled his people out of captivity. Sinai is where he gave the law and said, now here's what I expect of you. Which came first? The Exodus came before Sinai. Being comes before doing. God calls you his children. Then he tells you to act like it. Jesus made you right with him. Then he calls you to tell the world about it. Being comes before doing. You are married. And when you have trouble down the road and you think, I haven't really lived up to my calling today, that may be true. But you can live up to it tomorrow. Why? Because you are already married. Being is the motivation and the power for the doing. All right, Bart, get ready back there. Children, I want you to hold up those glow sticks. Remember, snap and shake. Okay, let's, uh, let's turn off the lights. Hold those up, please. I want you to look around. It's incredible how a little bit of light shows up in a dark place. Our world feels so dark sometimes, but I'm telling you, you could focus on that and drive yourself crazy, or you could look for the light. And if you can't find it, look in the mirror. I want you to know that if you ever struggle and wonder if you are what God's called you to be, oh, you can look at your list of failures. You can look at the things you didn't do right, the things you wish you had done. But I'm telling you, believe it. In the day when you gave your life to Christ, my God pronounced you salt and light. I told you the most powerful thing a preacher can do is saying, I now pronounce you. That happens in a wedding. It also happens in a baptism. When you come forward and give your life to Jesus Christ, we take you. We bury you under the water. And that's what we do with dead people. The old life is gone. And in the moment, when you come up out of that water, in that moment, I want you to know what God pronounces you. He pronounces you the light of the world, salt of the earth, empowered by him. And I want to do that for you this morning. I want us all to gather together with our arms locked together as we say one, uh, with one voice that you are now salt and light. Thank you for joining us. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been enriched. And if you have any questions, any thoughts, any comments, reach out to us at prayers at wschurch.net. God bless you. Tune in next week.